Trauma to the spine and spinal cord can occur in a variety of settings, including motor vehicle accidents, shallow water diving, and falls. Usually, significant trauma is needed to cause spinal injuries in an otherwise young, healthy individual. However, keep in mind that older patients or those with pre-existing conditions may have vulnerable bones. These conditions include rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, osteoporosis, and in many cases, just advanced cervical spondylosis. One should always suspect a serious spinal injury in these patients, even if the history might indicate minor trauma. Management should focus on minimizing risk of further injury. Always immobilize all patients with suspected spinal injury. Paramedics will have done this in the field by putting a cervical collar on the patient and by securing the patient to a rigid padded backboard with head supports in place. While you carry out your ABCs, make sure to keep the patient immobilized until you can clear the spine. In fact, if the patient has a head injury or is confused or complaining of spinal pain, assume that there's a spinal injury or even a spinal cord injury until proven otherwise and keep the patient immobilized. Failure to do so in the individuals with an unstable spinal injury can result in further neurologic damage. The spine can be cleared if there's an absence of cervical tenderness and neurologic deficits and normal radiographs. Following initial stabilization, continue to monitor the vital signs, keeping an eye out for signs of neurogenic shock. This can occur with injuries to the spinal cord above T6 and manifest as hypotension and bradycardia, depending upon how high the injury occurs in the spine. Treatment might include fluid resuscitation and vasopressors. Special consideration of airway management in cervical spine injury is due. High cervical cord injuries may result in inability to breathe due to diaphragmatic paralysis thus requiring immediate ventilatory support. Those with lower cervical injury may not immediately have respiratory distress because of preserved diaphragmatic function, but will develop delayed respiratory failure due to paralysis of accessory muscles of breathing. Anticipating the need for airway management in the cervical spine injured patient well ahead of time gives opportunity to enlist the help of airway experts, such as anesthesiologists, for example, in a controlled fashion. In the emergency setting, however, securing the airway in the most practiced fashion for the individual physician, and usually this is direct oratracheal intubation with inline stabilization, is best. Spinal injury at levels below the conus, and that is usually at or below L1, may result in compression of the cauda equina. This bundle of rootlets floating loosely in spinal fluid can tolerate a surprising degree of canal intrusion in the setting of trauma. In the patient with lumbar level spinal trauma, a more detailed myotomal and dermatomal examination with specific attention to perineal sensation may reveal focal deficits in the patient who at first screening might appear intact. 